Well, now to begin uh, today's uh, um, formal program in regards to presentations on the history, evolution, and societal impact of great Texas innovations, I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. John Mendelson. Uh, as I've stated a little earlier today, John needs no introduction, but um, I will say a few words about him. Uh, John has truly been uh, one of the great presidents of one of our UT institutions, which is uh, really the global leader in cancer care and cancer research, uh, which is MD Anderson. He arrived as president of MD Anderson in 1996. Uh, he was really, uh, together with his faculty and staff, uh, really in, uh, developed an incredible trajectory uh, for MD Anderson, both in clinical care uh, research as well as, uh, as public health uh, in so many regards. In his own right, he is a, a tremendous and prolific scientist uh, with great interests uh, on the EGF receptor and its function, as well as the development of uh, targeted treatments against certain receptors and inhibitors of tyrosine kinases uh, that can impact uh, cancer proliferation. Uh, so with that, John, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for everything you do on behalf of MD Anderson, uh, our nation, and our world. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Sigaroa. Um, <clears throat> we uh, just finished celebrating the 100th anniversary of targeted chemotherapy. Uh, the inventor was Paul Ehrlich, uh, who in 1910 created the first targeted chemotherapy, which was actually targeting a bacterial infection, <coughs> excuse me, rather than cancer. But it was very significant. Now on the right-hand side of this slide is uh, a depiction of Dr. Ehrlich's thinking. He worked in Frankfurt next to the big dye companies in Germany, and the dye companies produced dyes which the pathologists used to stain slides, and different cells took up different dyes and were different colors, and different bacteria took up different dyes and were different colors. And Ehrlich did what we call a Gedanken experiment. He postulated that cells had on their surface receptors which were, spe which were specific for organic molecules, these dyes, and that when the dye bound to the right cell that had the right receptor, it was taken up inside the cell and the cell produced new receptors, and that was his explanation for this phenomenon. Well, not only did he postulate this for dyes, he postulated there would be receptors for nutrients and for what we now call growth factors, chemicals that circulate in the body that can attach to a cell and stimulate proliferation. He also postulated that immune cells had receptors on their surface and could actually release these receptors into the environment, and that's what we call antibodies today. So uh, he won his Nobel Prize for entirely different work, for his work on serotherapy, but uh, he, he started this field, uh, which many of us are in today. Now his postulate was that if there were specific receptors, he could attach poisons to these organic molecules. That's on the right-hand side. The poison's the little dagger. That's my drawing, uh, not his. His would be more elegant. <coughs> and uh, he began uh, the field of experimental therapeutics in 1901. Uh, he linked arsenic to organic molecules. Uh, he produced a large series of these, an array of these, if I can use that term. Uh, he he uh, screened them for efficacy and, and toxicity. And the number 606, which we now call Salversan, uh, was found to be effective against syphilis in a rabbit model. Now at that point, he started, as far as I know, the first biotech company. He spun off from the university. The biotech company, in, in one year, scaled up production of Salversan. They ran clinical trials, recording efficacy and toxicity. It worked in people, and it became the first blockbuster. And it was effective against syphilis. So that was uh, 100 years ago. Now this slide just um, summarizes uh, very quickly targeted therapy of cancer. Uh, the first target was not really a drug, but castration. Huggins won the Nobel Prize for that. His work was in 1939, and then in 1971, uh, tamoxifen, which blocks the estrogen receptor, 
was shown to be an effective targeted therapy for breast cancer. Uh, the first drugs that were developed, uh, numbers two and three in that uh, list there, uh, we're targeting DNA synthesis. And Sidney Farber, pictured on the right, really produced the first uh, chemical agent, the first drug, in this case, amethopterin, which blocks folate metabolism required for the synthesis of DNA. And that was published in 1948. And that increased the average lifespan of a child with leukemia from three months to six months. They died at six months. Today, the average child with leukemia, 80% are cured. So a lot has happened since his pioneering work, which first proved that a targeted drug could affect cancer. And number four on that list there are the tyrosine kinases. These are enzymes that are attached to the surface of the cell, attached to some of these receptors that we, we just talked about, or can be in the cell. And there's a list there of different tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been developed. And cetuximab, that first one there, is the one I'm going to spend a little more time on, because that's the one that I worked on. <clears throat> Now, this work began in 1980 in collaboration with Dr. Gordon Sato uh, when I was at the University of California, San Diego. And we postulated that if we could make a monoclonal antibody which would bind to the EGF receptors on the surface of the cell and prevent access of the stimulating molecule, either EGF or something called TGF-alpha, we might be able to block cell proliferation by inhibiting the activation of the tyrosine kinase that's part of the EGF receptor. That was a novel hypothesis in 1980. Why did we make this hypothesis? Well, first of all, the EGF receptor had been characterized and EGF was characterized both by Stanley Cohen and he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1986 for this work. Secondly, it was learned that cancer cells could produce their own growth factor. Normally, the growth factor comes from the environment and binds to the receptor on the surface of the cell and stimulates the cell to proliferate. But cancer cells, it was found, could produce their own growth factor, release it, and auto-stimulate their own proliferation. Then it was found that the chemical activity of this receptor was what's called a tyrosine kinase. It phosphorylates tyrosine. At that time, there were only three tyrosine kinases known, and one of them was SARC. SARC is a gene that can cause cancer in mice and in man. It was only known in mice at that time. So we reasoned, well, this is a very, we thought it was very rare. And now there's nearly 100 tyrosine kinases. There were three known, and one of them caused cancer, and the EGF receptor had one. That might be important for cancer. It was found that many cancers had high levels of EGF receptors, uh, a Darwinian uh, move on their part. And I knew from experiments of nature that circulating antibodies in the circulation could bind to receptors and cause human disease. And there's three examples there that I won't go into detail on. Well, we began these studies in the early 1980s, and uh, they were successful, and we produced uh, a few antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, that could inhibit the proliferation of cancer cells growing in culture or in uh, nude mice, where you engraft the tumor into a, a mouse that has a, a weak immune system and can grow human tumors. And we were able to show with our collaborators that the mechanism of inhibiting the growth of the cells was by blocking the tyrosine kinase. We prevented that step that the tyrosine kinase stimulated. And this is the first example that I know of, of a drug. In this case, it's not a drug. It's an agent. It's an antibody. Uh, an agent that could block a tyrosine kinase and could block a receptor, uh, demonstrating that it could reduce the proliferation of cancer cells growing in animals. And the solid line above is the untreated animals. And the uh, line below with the circles is the animals treated with the antibody. Now, within a few years, uh, we were able to uh, carry out a clinical trial with this mouse antibody, and we labeled it with indium so we could see what happened to it. This, was, uh, this antibody is owned by the University of California, where I was working with Dr. Sato, and uh, it was licensed to Hybertech. And uh, I'm giving you the results of the first clinical trial ever done with an, an agent that blocks a tyrosine kinase or blocks a growth factor receptor. And the most important outcome of the trial was there was no toxicity 
Every epithelial cell, most of the cells in your body and my body have EGF receptors. But uh, we were banking on the fact that the normal cell would not be as perturbed by blocking that EGF receptor tyrosine kinase as the tumor cells. And I won't go into all the logic on that. Uh, but it, it, is, it was a risky thing in a sense. And the patients tolerated the antibody very well. We, we were able to get up to the shown dose. Uh, the, the antibody was labeled with tracers amounts of indium, and we were able to show that we could label tumors. The antibody zeroed in on the tumors in the patients that had metastatic lung cancer in this case. And we were able to maintain serum levels that could saturate the receptors on the tumor cells, which was required for the antibody to work. Uh, we also found that, as predicted, this is a mouse antibody, a monoclonal antibody, and the patients produced human antibodies against the mouse protein, and the NIH then converted our mouse antibody into a human chimeric antibody to avoid this immune reaction. Now, this was all very exciting, and you would think things would move very quickly, but nothing happened for four years. And very briefly, this is part of what's so uh, exciting and frustrating about developing new drugs. So, uh, in 1990, when we published this work, actually it was 91, there was tremendous skepticism that an antibody would ever be a useful agent in therapy. Uh, at that time, many companies were developing oral agents and intravenous agents that were chemicals that could block tyrosine kinases, and Hybrotech was sold to Eli Lilly, which had had bad luck with another antibody, and nothing happened for three years. Now, I want to remind you that today, half the new drugs against cancer are antibodies. It's only 20 years later, but in 1990, there was reticence to move forward with this. Well, uh, fortunately, a small company called Imclone uh, purchased the license from the University of California. Uh, they had very little money. They had to partner eventually both with Merck Germany and with Bristol-Myers. They developed the clinical trials that eventually led to regulatory approval of this antibody called cetuximab for head and neck cancer and for lung cancer. And ironically, Imclone was purchased uh, by Eli Lilly uh, in <coughs> last year for uh, substantial billions of dollars. So uh, this is a, that, that white line is the cell membrane. Uh, the, the blue is the uh, EGF receptor, and you can see the EGF receptor can be stimulated by EGF, and the antibody shown on the top blocks the binding of the EGF, and there are two antibodies now available uh, in yellow that carry this out, our antibody and another. Uh, you can also block the receptor by de developing chemicals that bind inside the cell and block the kinase, and there are two uh, oral agents that are listed there in yellow that do this. And there are actually nearly a dozen different agents that block the EGF receptors still in clinical trials today. Now, let's shift gears, and we've talked about targeting cancer cells, and now let's talk about personalizing that target. All the patients got this EGF receptor inhibitor. It only worked in 10 to 20 percent of the patients. The other 80 percent needlessly received this. Today, we're talking about personalized cancer therapy. And uh, the cancer centers in Texas are among the leaders in this. There are three factors that allow this. One is we know the cause of cancer. It's caused by the aberrant function of specific genes that control the growth of cells and their proliferation and their survival and what's called their plasticity, which allows them to metastasize and spread through the body. Uh, there's a list, there, there are 2,200, I'm sorry, there are 22,000 genes in our body in each cell, and there's probably about three or 400 genes that are relevant for the properties there. And if any one cell has typically a half dozen genes of this type that are functioning in an aberrant way, it usually dies, which would be great. But occasionally it doesn't die, and these genes functioning abnormally produce cancer. That's the model of cancer we have today. The second thing is the drug companies and academia, but primarily the drug companies are aware of this. And there are 800 drugs in the pipeline that attack the products of these genes. Two or 300 genes, 800 drugs in the pipeline. So you can see we've got a terrific army ready to attack these. And then the third fact, which makes personalized therapy possible, 
is this astounding uh, revolution in technology. The Human Genome Project, which began in 1991, took a decade. It cost $3 billion to sequence one genome, 10 years to sequence one genome. In 2010, we can sequence a genome in three weeks for about ten dollars to $20,000, and it's predicted that by 2012, we'll be able to sequence a genome in one week for $1,000. That's half the cost of a CAT scan. That means that we can biopsy a tumor and sequence the whole genome in a tumor and ask which genes in that list of two or 300 are abnormal in that tumor and then pick from that list of 800 drugs and apply them to the tumor and the prediction is we're going to get much better results. That's what we mean by personalized cancer therapy. So, uh, and the goal then is to treat each patient uh, <clears throat> with a drug that targets the genetic abnormalities in their cancer. And I want to emphasize that's not the only personalized part of cancer therapy. Uh, we have to take into account that the fact that there are genetic reasons why their body handles drugs differently, and we're beginning to understand that. The cellular environment around the cancer stimulates the cancer. These growth factors can come from around the cancer as well as from the cancer itself, and they can vary uh, genetically. Uh, there are immune responses to cancer which can be personalized, and lifestyle and behavior are very important, and I'll mention a diet smoking, and uh, exercise as three important factors. But I'm going to focus on that first one uh, for a few more minutes. So this, as far as I know, is a summary. This is Biology 101 summary of the first clinical trial that tested the hypothesis that we could target therapy against the gene abnormalities in a cancer cell. And you can see here the cancer cell on the surface at the top are uh, all these receptors I was talking about. They're probably uh, 50 to 100 different types of receptors, maybe even more than that, on the surface of a cancer cell. Uh, the investigators at MD Anderson picked the EGF receptor, the one that I had worked on previously. I, that was not why they picked it, uh, to uh, uh, address. Inside the cell, there is a uh, chemical called RAS, and another one called RAF, and uh, there are experimental drugs available against those in uh, 2004, and they picked that to assay. Then the RXR uh, has to do with retinoids and cyclin. I'm not going to have time to explain. And the fourth area was a VEGF, which is a molecule secreted by the cancer cells that stimulate the proliferation of blood vessels. Dr. Judah Falkman's work was mentioned earlier. So we developed ways to assay those four yellow boxes in biopsies from lung cancer patients who had failed standard therapy, a novel experiment. Now this shows how the experiment worked. There were 250 patients roughly sampled, and on the left you can see the list of the markers that were identified. We sequenced the genes and also looked at the expression of the genes. And on the right are the experimental drugs, not approved at that time by the FDA, that worked in experiments in animals against these various targets. And we asked a very simple question. If you're going to try an experimental drug against lung cancer, the typical thing would be to take 250 lung cancer patients and try the drug on them, or try three or four drugs in sequence on them without any background of what was wrong with their tumor. So the first 100 patients were randomized, and they just got one of these experimental drugs. The next 150 patients, we gave the drug to the patient who had the abnormality in their tumor for which that drug had been designed as an attack. And we asked the question, would that second group do better? <clears throat> and the answer, I wouldn't be telling you about this if it didn't work, is it did do better. So he, the uh, erlotinib attacks the EGF receptor. Right around that time, evidence was uh, uh, coming out that if the EGF receptor had a mutation that actually uh, uh, showed an enhanced response to erlotinib, and we, we ended up predicting that th these patients would do better, and indeed they did. And you can see a number of other uh, markers did predict that the patient would do better than that first control group. Very interestingly, there were some markers that predicted the patient would do worse. That last one, sinaferib, that drug, if the EGF receptor had a mutation, the patient did worse. We do not have a hypothesis to explain that. 
But it turns out then that by interrogating the tumor, we can predict what might work in a more likely fashion and what might work in a less likely fashion. And just to follow that up with the EGF receptor, I mentioned to you that it only works in about 20% of patients, uh, the cetuximab. These are studies that were done retrospectively in colon cancer where the patients were given the drug. And in the top is the response of the patients one of the curves, and I don't remember which one, but it doesn't matter because they're on top of each other. One of the curves shows the patient's given nothing, and the other shows patients given cetuximab, and there's no difference. And those are patients where the KRAS, that one of those in the cytoplasm uh, targets uh, that regulates a tyrosine kinase, it's not a tyrosine kinase itself, where the KRAS was mutated. But uh, in the bottom, when the KRAS was not mutated, you can see there's a doubling of lifespan uh, from uh, 4.8 to 9.5 months. So by selecting patients that have a normal KRAS, we can increase the response rate from 20% to 40% because we're getting rid of about half the patients. Half the patients do have a mutated uh, KRAS in colon cancer. And that kind of thing is going on at our institution and at many cancer centers, including uh, the excellent centers in uh, Texas. Uh, phase one trials, as I mentioned, are when drugs are given to a cancer patient for the first time. Typically, in the past, we've only been looking for toxicity and trying to find the right dose. Uh, Dr. Kurzrock convinced the drug companies to let her screen patients in this case, we're looking at something called PI3 kinase. It's another tyrosine kinase, or mTOR, which is a molecule in the cell related to the kinases. And uh, the drugs that she was testing were uh, attacking those as targets, and only patients that were placed, <coughs> were placed on the trials that had that abnormality in their tumor. And this is, many of these trials are first in man, where the, no, one, no human being has ever seen the drug. As I said, typically the response rate, if you get one or two responses, you're thrilled. And you can see that she got 40% response rates, response meaning disappearance of the tumor, which only occurred once, uh, a shrinkage of at least 50%, or stopping the growth of the tumor for six months. Now this is happening in other examples, and I'll give you one more, showing that now when we test new drugs, very quickly we're gonna be able to find the right patients that that drug might work on and move much more quickly to getting approval. Now my colleague Gordon Mills and I, uh, this is an experiment designed by Dr. Mills. Uh, we, spend, we, we stay awake nights finding titles for things. Battle stands for something. Uh, T9 is uh, 10,000 tumors, 10,000 tests, and 10,000 therapies. And here's Dr. Mills' hypothesis. There's a lot of work coming out now examining the gene abnormalities in human cancers. And he has a list of gene abnormalities that are present in at least 5% of cancers, just looking across the board. And we've developed ways to assay whether the genes are mutated for the genes that produce those uh, abnormalities that are present in 5% or more of cancers. And you can see the list of genes that we can look at. Uh, I mentioned PI3 kinase, AKT is related to that. RAS, we've talked about up at the top there, receptors we've talked about, and then uh, downstream effectors. And we have those assays up and running and we're adding more uh, every month. And Dr. Mills then has an experiment. Wait a minute, I must not have advanced the slide. So I was talking without you being able to see it, but this is the list of uh, uh, tests that we can do now for genes, uh, for mutations in genes where there's an abnormality in 5% of human cancers. So now we're taking patients that have advanced cancer, that have failed standard therapy, and we're screening them for any abnormality in these genes. And if we find the abnormality in these genes, and there happens to be a drug available that's already approved that is active against that gene product, we will give that to the patient. And there's two examples at the bottom there. In ovary cancer, HER2 is a rare abnormality. But when it's there, we're now treating with a drug against HER2 that's available, and the same for KIT. And if there are no approved drugs available, then we go to that list of 800 and pick a drug that's an experimental drug and we give that to the patient. So this is research going on 
and this is research that I'll be joining Dr. Mills with uh, in July as co-head of the institute that is sponsoring this research at MD Anderson uh, when my successor is, is picked uh, to, to run this, this great institution. Now, uh, it isn't just about MD Anderson. I wanted to talk about Texas uh, cancer research, so I'm going to give you three other vignettes. And the first comes from UT Southwestern. Uh, Addie Gazdar and John Minna have worked there for many years, and John ran their cancer center many years. And they've done an incredible thing. They've developed cell lines of human cancer, over 250, which they have shipped all over the world. And most of the research done in test tubes and in in mice, where human tumors are put in mice, are done with these cell lines. Uh, they also develop 60 cell lines of non-malignant normal lung uh, cells. Uh, they have used those to uh, look at the molecular mechanisms of growth in uh, lung cancer cells and also to test new drugs. Now this list is not an important list, but I want you to look at the second to the bottom figure on the list, these are a list of, of genes that have been found to be abnormal in lung cancer using these cell lines that Gazdar and Minna produced over the years. And the second to last one is called ALK. And it was only discovered in 2009 to be abnormal. One minute left. Okay. <laughs> we will have to shorten this. Um, now, there was a drug available against lymphoma. It's not a disease of lung cancer. It's a disease of white blood cells. Uh, the drug company was convinced to do a clinical trial, uh, first time it had ever been given to a lung cancer patient. Cancer patient. This abnormality is only present in 5% of lung cancer patients. They screened over, over 1,500 patients to find a little over 100 that they could do the study on. This was a national trial in many places. The drug they used is crizotinib. The response rate was 57%. Again, the first time a drug is given to a patient with lung cancer. Disease was stable in 33, in addition to that response rate. And at six months, the progression-free survival in advanced lung cancer is 72%, which is phenomenal. This means that we're going to be able to test drugs more efficiently and get them off to FDA approval more effectively. It also means that we're going to be able to avoid giving drugs to patients where they're not going to be effective. Now, one minute vignettes. The, sec the second example comes from uh, Ray Du Bois and Stan Hamilton at our institution looking at uh, cyclooxygenase, which produces prostaglandin E2. It was shown in, uh, in colon cancer uh, by Vogelstein, Furon, and Hamilton. This is at Hopkins. Hamilton is now our pathologist at MD Anderson. The colon cancer starts with normal colon and then polyps form and then cancer forms. And everybody in this room who's over 50 should have had a colonoscopy because if you take the polyp out, about 1% of them can become cancers. You avoid getting cancer. And the colon cancer death rate should go down 50% in this country. Well, Dr. Du Bois uh, was studying an enzyme uh, called COX-2, which was very uh, important in the development of uh, these uh, adenomas. And you can see that it's present in very high amounts in the cancer triple plus, And it's only present in normal amounts in the normal epithelium. And Dr. Hawk, the middle author here, in a series of uh, looking retrospectively at patients that had received non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like Advil, uh, which blocks cyclooxygenase, you can see a dotted line across there. And in patients that are taking this drug so they can play golf or do it, uh, treat rheumatoid arthritis or whatever, they had a lower incidence of colon cancer. So the exciting experiment was done. Can we prevent polyps? They took patients that had polyps. There's a high re risk of recurrence. Uh, and they said, can we reduce the recurrence of polyps by giving them celecoxib? Uh, uh, Celebrex was the uh, trade name of it. And indeed, there was a 33% reduction in polyps over a five-year period and a 50% reduction in polyps that had advanced adenomas, precancers in them. That's terrific. This is a prevention. But that was Dr. Levine at MD Anderson. Dr. Brasilier at MD Anderson was participating in another trial that used Vioxx, a similar drug. And they looked at the cardiac side effects. And there were thrombotic events. You can see uh, almost double 
in the patients that receive the drug and cardiac events, 2.86, almost triple. Vioxx is off the market because of this study. So there's, there's no free lunch. We can, we can redu reduce colon cancer polyps, uh, but at the risk of a slight increase in heart disease, and uh, drug companies are now trying to work out ways to get around the side effect. Let's see. It is past my time, so again, I'm going to be very brief here and say that uh, Kent Osborne at Baylor uh, studying breast cancer, that GFR is the growth factor receptor for EGF and related uh, uh, receptors called HER2. He found that estrogen receptors interacted with the growth factor receptor. Now, the estrogen receptor is normally in the surface of the cell, and uh, uh, in, inside the cell, and the growth factor receptor is on the surface. And he postulated that if you simultaneously treated with an estrogen blocker and a growth factor receptor blocker, you could get added effects. And this experiment proves that, and I'm not going to walk you through it. But uh, that has been translated into clinical care now. And the final example is prostate cancer. 40% uh, of us are going to get cancer, and anyone in this room that's male, it's over 60, has a better than 50% chance of having prostate cancer in their prostate as we sit here. The lifetime risk of diagnosis uh, of prostate cancer is 16%. Uh, the risk of death is 3 to 4%, so 80% of the people that get prostate cancer are not going to die from it. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about the PSA test, which I won't get into, but today if it's over 4, you biopsy. And 32% uh, of the people with a PSA over 4, it was known, have cancer in their prostate. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room have had this happen to them. We hypothesized if we block androgens, going back to Huggins' original work, with a drug now, could we prevent prostate cancer by blocking androgens? And the answer is yes, but. And this experiment, which is very important, was carried out by Ian Thompson at the UT San Antonio Health Science Center. So finasteride is a drug that's used to shrink large prostates, which make it hard to pass your urine. And they also uh, are used to treat baldness. And the question was, by randomizing uh, 18,000 men to get finasteride or no finasteride and watching them for seven years, would we cut the incidence of prostate cancer? This is a huge experiment. It took place at over 200 sites. You couldn't get in unless your PSA was less than three at the start. If the PSA went over four, you were biopsy, and at the end of the seven years, no matter what happened, you had a biopsy. So here's the result of that experiment. Uh, you can see that the drug, 18% had prostate cancer, the placebo, 24%. That's a 25% reduction in prostate cancer in the patients that took this drug that blocked the antigen receptor. However, when they got their prostate cancer, it was more malignant. That's the second line of data. The grade means more malignant, more likely to spread. The theory is that the, uh, the androgen receptor blockade really blocked the, uh, uh, the more benign type of prostate cancer rather than the higher grade. Well, the most interesting and final slide is this one, and that looks at what happened when they looked at the patients after seven years that had never had a PSA rise but agreed to have a biopsy anyway. So these are people that all had PSAs under four. And look at the spread here of the PSA levels in those individuals. And look at the percent that had cancer. PSA of 0 to 0 0.5, 7% had cancer. 13% of those had high-grade cancer. Moving on down, if your PSA was 3 to 4, 27% uh, had cancer. They would not be biopsied by current criteria. And 25% of those were high-grade. I don't have the answer for you, but I think I've shown you the complexity of trying to target therapy and the, uh, how complicated uh, treating cancer is. And I'm not going to tell you whether you should get a PSA test or not. So in summary, uh, there is a lot happening in cancer. A lot of it happened in Texas. It's going on at, at many of our institutions. I wish I could have discovered more. But we are going to be able to personalize therapy. 
and I think we have uh, the possibility to look forward to that uh, our grandparents, of course, when they were worried about dying, it was from infection and tuberculosis. And targeted therapy has reduced the death rate there, and I believe the same thing can happen in cancer over the next 25 years. Thank you.